Good morning. Good morning. Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to be at Pine Lake and all uh, the campuses by uh, extension. And, uh, but I've got to be honest with you. I'm glad to be anywhere after what happened to me in Little Rock, Arkansas. I went to Little Rock to speak at a charity event, and this pastor picks me up from the airport. We're driving to the event. We're chatting along the way. He says, yeah. He says, I, I told a young woman in our church, I said, Lee Strobel's going to speak tonight. She said, oh, the guy who wrote The Case for Christ, is he still living? <laughs> I'm just glad to be alive after that kind of introduction. But I flew in here from uh, Houston, Texas, where uh, Leslie and I moved recently, and um, we moved into a new house. We got a phone number assigned to us by the phone company. And you may think, yeah, big deal. It was a big deal to us. There's no kidding. When we lived in Chicago, the phone number they gave us was one digit away from the cab company. <laughs> Seriously. So two in the morning on Saturday nights, these drunk guys in bars would call for a cab. They'd misdial. Our phone would ring. It was bad enough getting waken up in the middle of the night, but then I had to get up, get dressed, get in the car. <laughs> it was such a hassle. So I think, I think we got a good number now. But, uh, you know, I grew up in Chicago, and uh, um, we moved down to Texas, and I never lived in the South before. So what did I do? I went to Amazon. I bought a book called How to Talk Texan. I learned to talk Texan, right? So I learned a bunch of things. I learned the difference between y'all and all y'all. I didn't know all y'all's plural. I, okay, it makes sense. Uh, but the thing I learned that I love the most is that in Texas, if you want to say to someone, thank you, you can say thank you, or you can say, I appreciate you. Isn't that nice? I appreciate you. And that's what I want to say to you. I appreciate you. I appreciate you taking time out today to come to worship God, to, to learn some more about who he is and what he does, to explore a bit of the supernatural that maybe we haven't given enough thought to. So we're going to talk today about the case for miracles. And I'm going to begin by telling you two true stories. And after each one of these stories, I want you to ask yourself a question. Is this story an example of a supernatural miracle or is it merely a coincidence? So the first story took place several years ago. Again, true story. It took place in Africa in a village near the equator. Uh, far from pharmacies, far from hospitals, a woman was giving birth, and she died in the process of giving birth to a little prematurely born son, and she also left behind a two-year-old daughter. Now, this precious little child was clinging to life. And there were no incubators in the village, no pharmacies, no electricities or anything like that. And so one of the helpers filled up a hot water bottle to keep the baby warm because the nights get cold even near the equator. And if he didn't have a hot water bottle to keep the baby warm that night, it wasn't going to make it. But as this helper was filling up the hot water bottle, it burst. And it was the last hot water bottle in the village. And without it, that baby would not survive the cold night. Well, there's a missionary doctor in the village, Dr. Helen Gro uh, Rosevere, and she gathered together all the orphans and said, let's pray for this little child that he might somehow survive the night. But one little 10-year-old girl by the name of Ruth, so filled with faith, she seemed to go too far. She prayed this. She said, please, God, send us a water bottle. It'll be no good tomorrow, God, because the baby's going to be dead. So please, send it this afternoon. And as if that request weren't audacious enough, she added this. And while you're at it, God, would you please send a dolly for the little girl so that she'll know you really love her? The doctor said later, I was put on the spot. Could I honestly say amen? I just did not believe that God could do this. Oh, yeah, I know he can do everything. The Bible says so. But come on, there are limits, aren't there? I mean, the only hope of getting a new water bottle would be from a parcel sent from home. But they had never received a parcel during the entire four years that she had worked in that village. Never one parcel. And besides, who would think to send a hot water bottle to the equator? Well, a couple hours later, a jeep pulled up and dropped off a 22-pound package. And the orphans pounced on it, and they ripped it open. They sorted through the contents. There was some clothing for them. There was some bandages for the leprosy patients. There was a bit of food. But wait a minute, there was something else. The missionary said, as I put my hand in again, I, 
I felt the, wait a minute, could it really be? And I grasped it and pulled it out. Yes, a brand new rubber hot water bottle. And she burst into tears. She said later, I had not asked God to send it. I had not truly believed that he could. And with that, little Ruth rushed forward and said, well, if God has sent the bottle, he must have sent the dolly too. And so they dug through the package, and sure enough, at the bottom of the package, they found this beautifully dressed doll. And Ruth said, can I go over with you, mummy, and give this dolly to the little girl so that she'll know that Jesus really loves her? Friends, that parcel was packed five months earlier by the missionary's former Sunday school class in Northern Ireland. And the leader felt prompted by God to include a hot water bottle, and a little girl contributed the doll. And that package, the only one ever to arrive in the village, happened to arrive on the very same day that little Ruth prayed for it with the faith of a child. Now let me ask you a question. Is that a miracle? Or is it merely a coincidence? Second story involves a brilliant African-American student from the inner city of Detroit, Michigan. He earned a full scholarship to Yale University. He had an ambition. He was going to become a great physician. And yet, he wasn't doing so well at Yale. He was failing chemistry class that first semester, and he had to get a good grade in chemistry if he ever hoped to fulfill this dream of becoming a physician. And so he prayed. He, he, he had to get an A on the final exam in order to pass the class. And he wasn't ready to take it. By a long shot, he wasn't ready. So he prayed to God. He said, Lord, medicine is the only thing I ever wanted to do. Would you please tell me what it is that you really want me to do? And his plan was, I'm going to study all night. I'm going to cram. If you ever cram for a test, right? I'm going to study all night. But he was so tired, he fell asleep. And all seemed lost until he had a dream. And in that dream, he's alone in the auditorium, the classroom, and a nebulous figure begins writing chemistry problems and their solutions on the blackboard. And so when he goes to take the test the next day, he's shocked because the first problem on the exam is the exact problem he saw in his dream with the answer to it. And the next one, and the next one, and the next one, and the next one. And he ended up acing the exam he got a good grade in chemistry, and he promised God, you'll never have to do that for me again. And he became an extraordinary physician. By the age of 33, he was the youngest director of pediatric neurosurgery in the country, performing pioneering brain operations on children at Johns Hopkins Hospital. You might have heard his name. It's Ben Carson. He later became one of the 10 most admired men in America, ran for president, is currently a member of the cabinet. So what do you think? Is that a mere coincidence? Or could it have been a miracle? Well, as you heard on the introduction, I was an atheist for much of my life. But ultimately, it was my two-year investigation of the historical evidence for the miracle of the resurrection of Jesus Christ that convinced me that he is the unique Son of God. And so it was that miracle that ended up bringing me to faith. And yet, my skeptical nature did not disappear. It's kind of in my DNA. My background's in journalism and law. Do you imagine you put those two things together? What kind of a jerk, that, skeptic, what kind of a skeptic <laughs> that you get? I mean, I believe the miracles of Scripture. I mean, I read the Gospels, and, and these are sober accounts of miracles. Even the opponents of Jesus didn't dispute the fact that he did miracles. They just got mad at him for doing them on the Sabbath. So I believed in all that, but I still wondered, is God still in the miracle business today? Is God still supernaturally intervening in people's lives in the 21st century? And so I decided to take my journalism training, my legal training, and I spent two years systematically investigating the realm of the supernatural. And I ended up writing a book about it called The Case for Miracles. And for that book, I traveled the country. I, I, I talked to esteemed scholars on, on all sides of the issues. In fact, three of my chapters in the book are an interview with the most famous skeptic in America, uh, Dr. Michael Shermer, editor of Skeptic Magazine. And I'm telling you what, the results of my investigation <laughs> blew me away. What are my conclusions? First, God is still in the miracle business. Second, miracles happen a lot more frequently than most people think. 
And third, many miracles are better documented than skeptics suppose. In fact, you're going to hear today, during this talk, from a woman whose miracle in her life is, is probably the best documented and the most amazing one I came across in these two years. And on top of that, by the end of this talk, you are going to witness a miracle. Seriously. You, by the end of this talk, are going to be a witness to a supernatural healing of God. So let's get started. Let's take a look at the four big questions about miracles. Number one, how do you define a miracle? What is a miracle? You know, we throw that word around all the time. You know, oh, it's a miracle. I got a parking place. You know, that stuff like that. But the truth is, God set up the world. He set up natural processes, and he generally works through those most of the time. Well, lots of philosophers have offered definitions of miracles, but as I've looked at all the various ones, the, the, the one that resonates most with me about as being the most accurate is by a, 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 the late professor Richard Pertill, who is a philosopher. He gave a five-point definition. So here's what a miracle is. A miracle is an event brought about by the power of God that is a temporary exception to the ordinary course of nature for the purpose of showing that God has acted in history. You get that? A miracle is an event brought about by the power of God that's a temporary exception to the ordinary course of nature for the purpose of showing that God has acted in history. So for me, when I see something absolutely extraordinary that has spiritual overtones, that is not explainable by natural processes, and is validated by independent sources or eyewitnesses, that's when the miracle bell goes off for me. So in other words, a dream about a nebulous figure writing chemistry problems on a blackboard, in and of itself, that's not miraculous. But if those equations happen to be the very same problems that present themselves the next day on an independently prepared examination, that does seem miraculous, especially when the incident comes after fervent prayers to God. Question number two. Aren't miracles impossible because they violate the laws of nature? A lot of skeptics have said that. Famous Scottish uh, skeptic, uh, David Hume, back in the 1700s said, miracles violate the laws of nature. You can't violate the laws of nature. Therefore, miracles are impossible. Well, it's just a misunderstanding of what a miracle is. If I were to take this Bible and drop it, the law of gravity says it would hit the floor. But if I take this Bible and drop it, and you reach in and grab it before it hits the floor, you're not violating the law of gravity. You're not overturning the law of gravity. You're not negating the law of gravity. You're simply intervening. You're simply intervening. And so, when God performs a miracle, what is he doing? He's simply intervening in the laws of nature that he himself created. Now, I believe, based on the scientific data, that we can be confident that it is God who created the laws of nature. It is God who created the universe. How do we know? Well, as philosopher William Lane Craig likes to put it, number one, everything that begins to exist has a cause behind it. Number two, virtually every scientist on the planet now agrees that the universe began to exist at some point in the past. So, if whatever begins to exist has a cause, the universe began to exist, therefore, the universe must have a cause behind it. Well, what kind of a cause can bring a universe into existence? He must be powerful because of the immensity of the creation event. He must be smart because of the mind-blowing precision of the creation event. He must be immaterial or spirit because it existed before anything else existed. It must be timeless or eternal because it existed before physical time came into existence. He must be personal because he had to make the decision to create. He must be caring because he so carefully crafted a habitat where we can flourish. And the scientific principle of Occam's razor tell us there would just be one creator. So, powerful, smart, spirit, eternal, personal, caring, unique, that's a pretty good starting point for describing the God of the Bible. 
So I'm convinced that Genesis 1-1 is correct when it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And if he is the creator, then of course he can intervene in his own creation. Christian intellectual Timothy Keller put it this way, if a God exists who is big enough to create the universe with all its complexity and vastness, why should a mere miracle be such a mental stretch? In other words, if God can cause a universe to come into existence, then walking on water or a virgin giving birth, those are mere child's play. Question number three, how common are miracles today? I was really curious about this, so I hired a respected public opinion polling firm to do a scientific poll of Americans, and here's what I found. Nearly two out of five American adults said they have had at least one experience in their life that they can only explain as being a miracle of God. Let me ask you a question. How many of you would say you have had an experience in your life that you can only explain as a miracle of God? Raise your hand. Yeah, isn't that amazing? It's about the same, the same statistic. Um, now, you can extrapolate this number. If 38% of American adults say they've had at least one miracle in their life, that means we would have had 94,792,000 miracles. Now, let's just pick a random number. Let's say 99% of them are wrong. Let's say 99% are mistaking just an amazing coincidence for a miracle. So let's write off 99%. That still leaves us with a million miracles. Uh, that's, that, that's many more than I anticipated. Now, Skeptic Magazine says that only the uneducated and uncivilized believe in miracles. And yet, another survey showed that a majority of physicians in the United States, 55% say they have seen in their practice of medicine a miracle of God. And these are highly educated individuals who are not easily fooled by what the human body does. So, friends, miracles occur a lot more frequently than people suppose. Could it be that we just need to open our eyes a bit wider to the supernatural work of God among us. Question number four. How can we know that a miracle is genuine? How can we know? I mean, many times we'll see something on TV that seems like a big show, and you wonder, okay, come on, was that real, or was that just put on? Is that, is that just a show? Um, I mean, it could be the placebo effect. The placebo effect is when people think they're going to get better, and sure enough, they tend to get better. Or it could be a mistaken diagnosis. Or it could be fakery. It could be fraud. It could be faulty memories. Sometimes illnesses spontaneously disappear. Now, generally they come back, and generally that, that disappearance happens over a period of time, but that does happen from time to time. All of that is true, and yet it does not explain away all of the examples of the miracles that we see. There are other healings and supernatural events that are simply inexplicable apart from the hand of God. So how can we tell if something miraculous has occurred? Well, some skeptics like to ratchet up their skepticism to unreasonably high levels when we talk about miracles. I was like this when I was an atheist. For example, one atheist wrote an article in Skeptic Magazine and said, what would it take for me to believe a miracle has happened? She said, well, if a chicken learned how to read and then beat a grandmaster in chess, that I might maybe consider it supernatural. Now, I think that's setting the bar of skepticism unreasonably high. Here's my view. I think we can reasonably conclude that a miracle has occurred if we have solid documentation and multiple and credible eyewitnesses who have no motive to deceive, if there is no alternative natural explanation for what happened, and if it occurs in the context of a, a spiritual experience, in other words, prayer. So scientists have, have, have endeavored to try to determine, can we measure this? Can we actually prove or show scientifically that miracles take place? And so a professor with a PhD from Harvard University, who is a professor at Indiana University, major secular school, heard that there had been some miracles taking place in the country of Mozambique, in Africa. And we often see 
uh, this, the, these clusters of miracles take place in areas where the gospel is just now breaking in. For instance, in China, uh, it's been estimated that up to 90% of people in China who joined the, the Christian church uh, either themselves have had a healing supernaturally or they know somebody who has. So we see this happening often in, in these cultures where the gospel is just breaking in. So this PhD from Harvard, Indiana University professor, says, I'm going to check it out. I'm going to investigate it. So she takes a team of scientists, and they go to Mozambique. And they go into these remote villages, and they say, they say bring us your deaf and bring us your blind. And so all the deaf and blind would come, uh, or those with severe hearing or vision loss, and they would scientifically test their hearing and test their vision so they could determine what is their vision loss, what is their hearing loss. And then immediately they are prayed for by people who have a track record of God using them in healings. And they are prayed for and hands are laid on them and prayed for in the name of Jesus Christ for their healing. And then immediately after that, they're scientifically evaluated again, tested again for their vision and for their hearing. And guess what they found? Virtually everyone had some degree of healing or another. In fact, some of them astoundingly were healed, like Martine, who when she, they first encountered her, could not hear the equivalent of a jackhammer next to her. And after 10 minutes in prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, she could hear a normal conversation. And so the scientists said, this is too amazing. We've got to check this, double check this. So they went to Brazil to see if they could replicate the results. They got the same results. So this is a rigorous scientific study that has been published in a secular, peer-reviewed, scientific medical journal. And I went and I interviewed Dr. Candy Gunther Brown, who is the woman, PhD from Harvard, who conducted this study. Here's what she said to me, quote, she said, Lee, our study shows that something is going on. This is more than just wishful thinking, she said. It's not fakery. It's not fraud. It's not some televangelist trying to get widows to send in their money. It's not a highly charged atmosphere that plays on people's emotions. Something, she said, is going on. And I agree. I think it's something supernatural. Well, my book talks about a lot of documented miracles, but the one that absolutely blew my mind involves a woman by the name of Barbara Snyder. Uh, I interviewed Barbara at length, we have years and years of her medical records from the Mayo Clinic and, and other hospitals and doctor's offices. Uh, we have multiple credible eyewitnesses to what occurred. They have no motive to deceive. Two physicians were so flabbergasted by what occurred with her, they've written books about it. So let me tell you her story. Barbara was diagnosed at the Mayo Clinic with multiple sclerosis. Uh, she deteriorated over a period of years. Uh, very severely. She was repeatedly hospitalized. She had multiple surgeries. And the doctors finally concluded there's nothing more we can do for her. Um, she was going to get pneumonia again, which she got on a regular basis. They said, next time, don't try to resuscitate her. We got to just let her die. There's no hope. In fact, one of her physicians, Dr. Harold P. Adolph, who is a board-certified surgeon who's conducted 25,000 operations in his career, called Barbara, quote, one of the most hopelessly ill patients I've ever seen. So here she is. She's at home in hospice. She's going to die. One lung is non-functional. The other lung is 50% inflated. A tube is inserted into her neck so that she could breathe. It's connected to oxygen canisters in the garage that are pumping oxygen to this tube so she could breathe. She'd lost control of her urination and her bowels, she was legally blind. All she could see were shapes, gray shapes. A feeding tube was inserted into her stomach. She was curled up like a pretzel. Um, she hadn't walked in seven years. Her legs had atrophied. Her muscles were just thin and, and virtually gone in her legs. She hadn't walked in so long. Her hands, she's curled like a pretzel. Her hands, her fingertips are curled to the point where they were touching her wrists, and her feet were permanently extended in a downward position. And though, here she is, and who knew how long she had left? Not very long. Well, one day, a Christian friend of hers called WMBI, which is the Christian radio station in Chicago where, this, where she lived, and said, would y'all pray, all y'all, would y'all pray for Barbara? 
And so we know that 450 Christians began to pray in the name of Jesus for the healing of Barbara. How do we know? Because 450 people wrote letters to Barbara explaining that they're praying for her. So what happened? Well, I'm going to let Barbara tell you herself. Here's what she said. June 7th, 1981, I'll never forget it. It was a day like any other day for me. That was one spent confined to bed, unable to breathe on my own, hooked up to machines, a tracheostomy tube in my neck, my arms curled up, my legs curled up. I lay there trapped inside my own body is really how it felt. I had two friends over. They came over all the time. They were from my church. My church family never forgot me. Mm. So while they were there, I still remember exactly what they were reading when all of a sudden um, I heard a booming, authoritative, loud voice over my shoulder over here say, my child, get up and walk. And there was nobody else in the room. And there was no one else in the room, and the door was over here. There were windows over this way. And instantly I knew it was God. But instantly I also knew that my friends didn't hear that, hmm. which is kind of interesting too. Yeah. Um, and I needed to share with them what I heard. Well, I had this tracheostomy tube in my neck, that's how I breathed, and I had hands that did not work. So my friends said whenever I looked agitated, they knew I wanted to talk. So they'd come and plug the hole in my neck. And I said, I don't know what you're gonna think about this, but God just told me to get up and walk. And my friends got really quiet. <laughs> I know, but he really did tell me to get up and walk, run. Get my family. I want them to be here. And um, my friends all of a sudden jumped up. And while they jumped, so did I. I was so excited I couldn't wait for anyone. And I literally jumped out of the bed. This, this is where you'd almost have to have known me to see how totally impossible that was. So this time, I remember reaching up and pulling my oxygen off my neck. I remember that. And then I jumped toward the voice. My friends are over here, but I jumped towards the voice. And as I jumped up, the first thing I remember isn't what I would think I would remember, but I jumped out of the bed and I looked and I saw my feet. They were flat on the ground, just like everyone else's, which sounds normal, but not for me. I had foot drops so badly I couldn't even wear slippers on my feet. They were so curled. So when I jumped up to have feet flat, I was amazed and stood staring at my feet and when I did that, I jumped like this, and then I saw my hands, and they were open, and they never opened. And so now they were open, and I stood staring at them, and then it dawned on me I could see me. That's what I would have thought I would have noticed mm. first, was my vision, but I didn't. It I was noticed, back. You could see. It was back. I was perfectly fine. And I stood staring again for a little while, just feeling what it felt like to look at and see me. And then I turned, and that's when we were like women. We all started jumping up and down, screaming and thanking the Lord. I remember I didn't understand anything, except where once I was real sick, I was well again. And it has to be God. That's all I knew. <laughs> Barbara was totally... Her vision was back, her body was healed. Her mother came running into the room, fell to her knees, grabbed Barbara's calves and said, you have muscles again. Her leg muscles returned after seven years of atrophying, which she hadn't walked. She, her muscle tone instantly returned. Her father comes in and grabs her, and they begin to do a waltz around the family room. Well, that night, there was a service at her church, which was a Wesleyan church outside Chicago. And uh, so the pastor's up there, and he's doing the announcements, and he says, anybody have any other announcements we ought to make? And Barbara comes walking down the front aisle, the, the center aisle. And the church had never seen Barbara except in a wheelchair. They all knew she was dying. And here she comes walking fully healed down the aisle, and the church just spontaneously broke out singing, Amazing Grace, I once was blind, and now I see. The next day, she goes to another one of her physicians, Dr. Thomas Marshall, an internist for 30 years. And he said later, when she came walking down the corridor toward me, my first thought was, oh, she died, and that's a ghost. <laughs> he said, quote, this is medically impossible. Friends, God instantly, completely, and astoundingly healed her in one miraculous moment. There is no natural explanation. And by the way, even if there were, how do you explain this voice 
that told her against all common sense to get up and to walk. Today, she's been healed completely for over 30 years. She married a pastor, and together they pastor a little church in Fredericksburg, Virginia. Her doctor, Dr. Marshall, wrote this, I have never witnessed anything like this before or since and considered it to be a rare privilege to observe the hand of God performing a true miracle. Man, I was just blown away as I researched this healing of Barbara Snyder. And it's just one of many that I researched during these two years. I had incredible accounts of the dead coming back to life, of people being healed instantaneously of deafness and blindness and burns and broken ankles and shriveled hands and meningitis. Friends, here's the point. God is still in the miracle business today. And what does that tell us? What does that tell us about God? First of all, it tells us he's real. He's real. He exists. These miracles point people toward the reality that there is a supernatural creator. He does exist. Jesus said in John 4, verse 48, unless you people see signs and wonders, you'll never believe. Well, God is still performing signs and wonders, leading people to conclude that God is real. Second, these miracles show that God is powerful, that nothing is too difficult for God. And third, it reminds us God is loving. God is loving. When, when someone like Barbara experiences a supernatural healing like this, that's just a reminder of how much he loves her. Now, what about those cases where people are prayed for and they don't get healed in this life? Because sometimes we don't get healed the way we want to be healed in the time that we want the healing to take place. That, that's reality. And I knew I couldn't write a book about this without exploring that issue. And I do in the book, and it's much too much to get into in, um, right now. But I'll, I'll hit the highlights and tell you that you know, the truth is God is sovereign. When I talk to people who experience supernatural healings, they inevitably say to me, I don't know why me. Why me? I don't, I don't know. I don't know. God is sovereign. He will do as he will do. His ways are above our ways. He sees things and understands things that we do not. Sometimes he will tolerate short-term suffering because it's the only way to achieve a long-term good in someone's life. And friends, God promises and he delivers that all those who follow him will be healed as we enter into the next life. And we've got to keep in mind, healings were not automatic in the New Testament either. Matthew says that Jesus didn't do many miracles in Nazareth. Uh, Matthew chapter 10 uh, tells us the disciples were given the authority to heal, and yet seven chapters later, they were unable to heal a paralytic boy. Uh, Paul didn't heal everybody. He left Trophimus behind when Paul went off on a missionary journey. Paul was never healed of the thorn in his flesh that he talks about. So we have to understand... God's ways are above our ways. Uh, he sees things that we don't see, but he promises there a day will come if we follow him that healing ultimately will take place. But in the meantime, I promised you that you would become a witness to a supernatural healing. And you are right now. You ready? I, seriously, you ready to experience, to see for yourself a supernatural healing? All right, all right, we're going to do it. We're going to do it. It's a story of Dwayne Miller. Dwayne was pastor of a Baptist church not far from where I live now in Houston. And one day, he had a virus, and that virus paralyzed his vocal cords. His vocal cords became limp. And, and for all practical purposes, it destroyed his voice. He, he talked like this, this raspy voice. And he felt like there was a hand on his throat. He felt like there was a hand constricting his throat. And, of course, he could no longer be a pastor. He couldn't speak. And um, he went through a succession of jobs. It was a terrible time in his life. Over three years, he was examined by 63 physicians, including a symposium in Switzerland of voice experts. And they examined him. And when he asked, what is my prognosis for recovery? He was told, zero. Ain't going to happen. Your vocal cords are limp. They've been paralyzed. Well, he used to teach a Sunday school class at First Baptist Church in Houston. And one day he got a phone call from the Sunday school class saying, hey, Dwayne, would you come and teach one of our classes one day? And he said, well, you know, it's really hard for me to talk. And they said, Dwayne, we know your voice is really annoying to listen to. Um, 
but we love you, and we'd love to have you back and just teach one class. Would you do that? And he said, we'll put a microphone on you to amplify your voice. And he said, okay. So he comes on that day, and his text is Psalm 103. The third verse of that psalm says, God heals all your diseases. And Miller said later, with my tongue I was saying, I still believe that God heals, but in my heart I was screaming, but why not me, Lord? Why not me? So he goes on to the next verse, which reads, the Lord redeems your life from the pit. And he told the class, I have had and you have had at times past pit experiences. And as soon as he said the word pit, for the first time in three years, this choking sensation from his throat disappeared. And his voice began to be instantly and totally healed. But you don't have to take my word for it, because guess what? They tape recorded the class. And you are going to witness right now this miracle as it took place. So listen to this. So when the psalmist writes, and he heals all of my diseases, let me say to you that I believe God still heals. That hasn't ended. That is not over. So the psalmist says, I'm excited. Bless the Lord, O my soul. One of his benefits is he heals all of my diseases. And in verse 4 he says, and he redeems my life from the pit. Now, I like that verse just a whole lot. I have had, and you have had in times past, pit experiences. We've both had, we've all had times when our life seemed to be in a pit, in a grave. And we didn't have an answer for the pit we find ourselves in. And I don't understand this right now. I'm a bit overwhelmed at the moment. I'm not quite sure what to say or do. <laughs> I'm uh, <laughs> It sounds funny to say at a loss for words. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. I Dwayne Miller's voice was healed at that moment. And if I continued to play that tape, you would hear it get clearer and clearer and clearer to the point where he goes to the doctor the next day and is examined. And the doctor says, I don't understand this. Not only is your voice completely and totally restored, but all the scar tissue is gone. Your voice is it's like a baby's voice. It's perfect. It's pristine. Doctor said, if I could explain how you got your voice back by coincidence, which I can't, I could never explain what happened to the scar tissue. So today... Dwayne is the pastor of a church in the Dallas area. And guess what else he does? He has a radio show every day in Dallas where he uses his voice to tell other people about the God who is still in the miracle business. Friends, that blows my mind. I don't know about you, but when I think of the fact that you know, our God is not a deistic God who's distant and disinterested from us and, and, and detached from us. He is a God who cares about us, who is involved in the world, who can be involved in our lives. Do you know him? Have you met him? Do you want to? You can. 
And we saw baptism. That's a miracle in and of itself. The redemption of a human soul, the transformation of someone's uh, worldview and their philosophy and their attitudes and their morality and their, their character. Uh, that's a miracle in and of itself. You can have that miracle in your life. If you come to him in repentance and faith, you can meet him, you can know him for eternity. And maybe you've got an issue in your life and it seems intractable. It seems uh, beyond anybody's capacity to fix. And you hear about a miracle-working God and something inside of you says, I need prayer. I need my issue that looms in my life to be lifted up to the throne of grace. I need God to do for me what he did for Barbara, what he did for Dwayne. I need help. And God is the only source, powerful enough and loving enough and caring enough to meet my needs. Friends, we're going to end the service in a few minutes and we're going to have some people up front who are um, staff from here at the church, volunteers from the church, and they're ready to pray for you. If you've got an issue in your life, I remember several years ago when I was on the verge of death, when I was, my wife found me unconscious and I didn't know what the future was going to hold. I walked forward at a church like this and an elder of the church put his arms around me and he prayed for me and God healed me. Maybe that's what you need today. Don't let anything hold you back from meeting God from bringing him your needs right now. So let me pray for you, because I appreciate you. Father, we thank you that you are a God who is the same today as you were yesterday. And you are the same God that performed the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and in the same way, you can resurrect in us that which we thought was totally lost. So we pray for those that even in this moment, in repentance and faith, want to reach out and meet you, to know you, to experience you today and forever. And Father, for those that are suffering, for those that have burdens that seem too much to bear, give them the courage to come up and just lay that on your altar, that you might heal them in ways that we don't even understand at this moment. So we thank you for your greatness, for your power, for your love, for your mercy. We thank you for this church that loves people, that loves to see you work in their lives now and for all eternity. We thank you for all this in the name of Jesus Christ and all God's people said, amen.